The Lord is with you. Let us pray. God of all power and love, we give thanks for your unfailing presence and the hope you provide in times of uncertainty and loss. Send your Holy Spirit to enkindle in us your holy fire. Revive us to live as Christ's body in the world. A people who pray, worship, learn, break bread, share life, heal neighbors, bear good news, seek justice, rest and grow in the spirit. Whenever and however we gather, Unite us in common prayer and send us in common mission that we and the whole creation might be restored and renewed through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us hear the words from our Holy Scripture. A reading from Exodus. When the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, the people gathered around Aaron and said to him, Come, make gods for us who shall go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. Aaron said to them, Take off the gold rings that are on the ears of your wives, your sons, and your daughters, and bring them to me. So all the people took off the gold rings from their ears and brought them to Aaron. He took the gold from them, formed it in a mold, and cast an image of a calf. And they said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. When Aaron saw this, he built an altar before it, and Aaron made proclamation and said, Tomorrow shall be a festival to the Lord. They rose early the next day and offered burnt offerings and brought sacrifices of well-being. And the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to revel. The Lord said to Moses, Go down at once. Your people whom you brought up out of the land of Egypt have acted perversely. They have been quick to turn aside from the way that I commanded them. They have cast for themselves an image of a calf and have worshiped it and sacrificed to it and said, these are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. The Lord said to Moses, I have seen this people, how stiff necked they are. Now let me alone so my wrath may burn hot against them and I may consume them. And of you, I will make a great nation. But Moses implored the Lord his God and said, O oh Lord, why does your wrath burn hot against your people whom you brought out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? Why should the Egyptians say, it is with evil intent that he brought them out to kill them in the mountains and to consume them from the face of the earth. Turn from your fierce wrath, change your mind, and do not bring disaster on your people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your servants, how you swore to them by your own self, saying to them, I will multiply your descendants like the stars of heaven. And all this land that I have promised, I will give to your descendants, and they shall inherit it forever. And the Lord changed his mind about the disaster that he planned to bring on his people. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people.
The second reading, a reading from Philippians. My brothers and sisters, whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, and firm for I urge Eudoia and she to be of the same mind in the Lord. Ask you also, my loyal companion, help these women. They have struggled beside the gospel together with Clement, the rest of my co-workers who are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. Let us be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Do not worry about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, beloved, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence and if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Keep on doing the things that you have learned and received and heard and seen in me. And the God of peace will be with you. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. Thanks be to God. This is the Holy Gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, according to Matthew. Once more, Jesus spoke to the people in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding banquet for his son, he sent slaves to call those who had been invited to the wedding banquet, but they would not come. Again, he sent other slaves saying, tell those who have been invited, look, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen and my fat calves have been slaughtered and everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. But they made light of it and went away, one to his farm, another to his business, while the rest seized his slaves, mistreated them, and killed them. The king was enraged. He sent his troops, destroyed those murderers, and burned their city. Then he said to his slaves, the wedding is ready, but those invited were not worthy. Go therefore into the main streets and invite everyone you find to the wedding banquet. Those slaves went out into the streets and gathered all whom they found, both good and bad. So the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to see the guest, he noticed a man there who was not wearing a wedding robe. And he said to him, friend, how did you get in here without a wedding robe? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the attendants, bind him hand and foot and throw him into the outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. The Gospel of the Lord. Hey, Tom, can you unmute your computer? Uh, 
sinners in the hands of an angry God. That was the title of probably the most well-known sermon preached in colonial America. It was preached by Jonathan Edwards in 1741. And still, it can be found today in texts in American literature. Why? Because of its graphic images. Although Edwards read in a monotone voice from a manuscript without ever looking up, the images made some people cry out and others to faint. I won't quote any of those images. Let's just say they're not appropriate in this setting. But the gist of the sermon is that God is very angry with you because of your sins and holds you in his hands over a flaming place where you would not want to go and could drop you at any moment. I don't know about you, but I don't believe that. Yet when I read the lectionary passages from Exodus and Matthew, I was reminded of this sermon. Why? Let's look first at the story in Exodus. Moses had been gone up on the mountain for a long time. It said it was to be with the God who led them out of Egypt. The people grew impatient. All the other peoples around them had images of their gods and they wanted one too. So Aaron made a golden calf and they sacrificed to their God represented by the golden calf. God saw what they were doing. He had told them that there were to be no images, and he was furious. Princess, it was always he in that period, but that's a topic for another day. So God told Moses that he was going to destroy those wicked people. But Moses was finally able to talk him out of it. See why it made me think of sinners in the hands of an angry God? This seems to me to be a strange view of God. I think it's because there are many traditions in the Bible, and this is a very old one. As they developed their view of God, the Israelites were often influenced by the religions of the people around them. And many of those religions had gods that got very angry and demanded that people sacrifice to them to placate them. Those people also made images of their gods, such as a golden calf or a bull. Now Israel quickly learned that their god wanted no images of him, but they struggled with whether God got angry with them, and they continued to offer sacrifices. When I was a senior in college, I took a course in biblical interpretation. One day, the professor invited a Jewish rabbi to tell us about their tradition and worship. When time for questions came, like a smart aleck kid, I was going to put him on the spot. I asked him how they justified not sacrificing because the Old Testament says without the shedding of blood, there can be no forgiveness of sins. He immediately replied that sacrifice was clearly required in the Old Covenant, but Jeremiah announced that God was establishing a new covenant, a covenant of the heart. Therefore, there was no longer a need for sacrifice. I was stunned. It took me quite a while to process that there was more than one covenant, and especially that there was more than one tradition in the Hebrew Bible. 
Yet, when we look at the gospel lesson for today from Matthew, we see Jesus telling a parable which seems to raise the same issue. A king, seemingly representing God, invites people to his wedding banquet. When they refuse to come, he gets angry. With one group who kills his servants, he gets so angry he sends his troops to kill the people and burn their city. Then after inviting people off the street to the banquet, he sees one without a wedding garment and he binds him and throws him out into outer darkness. Is Jesus presenting a view of sinners in the hands of an angry God? That's what this story seems to say. But I think it's probable that Jesus didn't tell the parable quite that way. When Jesus tells this parable in the Lucan tradition, the king is angry that people won't come, but he invites in the least of these, fills the banquet hall, no one is harmed and no one is thrown out. This is a more appropriate way of dealing with the legitimate emotion of anger. Why the difference? The Matthean tradition is more in line with the older Jewish tradition, whereas the Lucan tradition is more in line with the Jewish tradition of the prophets and the Pauline Jewish and Gentile tradition. So not only are there varying traditions in the Hebrew Bible, there are also varying traditions in the New Testament. That's one reason why biblical interpretation is so challenging. I was introduced to a different way of thinking about some of these things during my first year in theological school, but it wasn't in school, it was in church. John Claypool preached a sermon entitled, Changed by the Cross. In it, he asked a simple question. What was the purpose of the cross? Was it to change God or was it to change us? Through the ages, the church has usually answered that it was to change God. God could not forgive our sins without a blood sacrifice. Since Jesus' blood was of infinite value, his sacrifice made God able to forgive our sins. It's called the substitutionary atonement. Jesus was our substitute. This has tended to be the predominant view in the history of the church, and we find it throughout the older church liturgies, including some in the Red Book of Common Prayer in the Episcopal Church. But there was another view. It's been called the moral influence view. The cross showed us the extent to which Jesus was willing to go to stand up for the oppressed and the disadvantaged, and it cost him his life. It was not because an angry God required a sacrifice it was because the religious and Roman authorities were oppressing and taking advantage of others, and Jesus spoke out against them. They were angry with him and put him to death because of it. He was killed because he was acting as he had called us to act. The cross calls us to change, to love God, and to love our neighbor no matter who our neighbor is. As I thought about all of this, I came to realize that God was not angry in demanding a blood sacrifice for my sins. God was compassionate and loving in calling me into relationship with God and into a compassionate and loving relationship with all my neighbors, just like Jesus had come to teach us and show us. But that's not always easy to do. 
in Paul's letter to the Philippians in our epistle lesson for today, he speaks of Euodia and Syntyche, who had been so faithful working with him, but now they had become involved in some kind of disagreement. He calls on others to try to help them get back together. It's just one example of a never-ending task in the life of any group of Christian people who are trying to live out their faith. We always have to work at the task of loving and working with our neighbors, even in the life of the church. This is a group of complicated and difficult lectionary readings for today. So where do all these complicated readings leave us? leave us? Are we sinners in the hands of an angry God? I would affirm that indeed we are not. On the contrary, we are a people in relationship with a compassionate and loving God who calls us to extend that compassion and love to our neighbors, no matter who they are or how much we might differ with them, even within our own church family. Amen. The prayers of the people are form three. Father, we pray for your holy Catholic church that we all may be one. Grant that every member of the church may truly and humbly serve you, that your name may be glorified by all people. We pray for all bishops, priests, and deacons, that they may be faithful ministers of your word and sacraments. We pray for all who govern and hold authority in the nations of the world, that there may be justice and peace on the earth. Give us grace to do your will in all that we undertake that our works may find favor in your sight. Have compassion on those who suffer from any grief or trouble, that they may be delivered from their distress. Give to the departed eternal rest. Let light perpetual shine mm -hmm. upon them. We praise you for your saints who have entered into joy. May we also come to share in your heavenly kingdom. Let us pray for our own needs and those of others. We hold these persons in prayer. Kathy, Charles, Charles, Sam, Christine, Susan, Jim, Jim, Kalina and her parents, John, Janice, David, Daniel, Emily, Margaret, Courtney, John, Rachel, Bobby, Gerald, Charlotte, Jean, Carolyn, and Wayne and Connie. Pray also for those who have died for Ennals, Bud, Charlotte, and Carolyn, and for their family and friends. We pray to you also for the forgiveness of our sins. Have mercy upon us, most merciful Father. In your compassion, forgive us our sins, known and unknown, things done and left undone. And so uphold us by your spirit that we may live and serve you in newness of life to the honor and glory of your name through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life.
May God be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and truly a good and joyful thing to give you thanks, all holy God, source of life and fountain of mercy. You have filled us in all creation with your blessing and fed us with your constant love. You have redeemed us in Jesus Christ and knit us into one body. Through your spirit, you replenish us and call us to fullness of life. Therefore, joining with angels and archangels and with all the faithful of every generation, we lift our voices with all creation as we say together, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed are you, gracious God, creator of the universe and giver of life. You formed us in your own image and called us to dwell in your infinite love. You gave the world into our care that we might be your faithful stewards and show forth your bountiful grace. But we fail to honor your image in one another and in ourselves. We would not see your goodness in the world around us. And so we violated your creation, abused one another and rejected your love. Yet you never cease to care for us and prepared the way of salvation for all people. Through Abraham and Sarah, you called us in a covenant with you. You delivered us from slavery, sustained us in the wilderness, and raised up prophets to renew your promise of salvation. Then in the fullness of time, you sent your eternal word, made mortal flesh in Jesus. Born into the human family and dwelling among us, he revealed your glory giving himself freely to death on the cross. He triumphed over evil, opening the way to freedom and life. On the night before he died for us, our Savior Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his friends and said, take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. As supper was ending, Jesus took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you and for all for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim together the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Remembering his death and resurrection, we now present to you from your creation this bread and this wine. By your Holy Spirit, may they be for us the body and blood of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Grant that we who share these gifts may be filled with the Holy Spirit and live as Christ's body in the world. Bring us into the everlasting heritage of your daughters and sons. And with St. James and all your saints, past, present, and yet to come, may we praise your name forever and ever. Through Jesus Christ, with Jesus Christ, and in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, do you be honor, glory, and praise forever and ever. Amen. And now as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.
Hallelujah. Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. My friends, we have the gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith and with thanksgiving. The body of Christ, I am. The blood of Christ, we are. Let us pray. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. You have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart through Christ our Lord. Amen. May Christ, Son of God, be manifest in you that your life may be a light to the world. And the blessing of God, creator, redeemer, and giver of new life, be upon you this day and remain with you always. The peace of Christ be always with you. Um, I have a few announcements and then we'll have a benediction. Um, if you have ever been curious or wanted to dig your toe into um, contemplative prayer, um, wondered about what that would be like, I invite you to join the adult forum class that meets at 9.15 on Sunday mornings. We're moving through Thomas Keating's book, Open Mind, Open Heart. It looks like this. You could buy it at Sassafras or Malaprops or order it online. And it's a beautiful introduction in how to begin a contemplative prayer practice. Um, in your own life. Um, it's the kind of conversation as always on Sunday mornings in adult forum that you, you don't miss anything. You can enter at any point in the conversation. We are like a Mobius strip. If you remember that from high school, we, we circle around and in, and we're always coming back around. So, um, I encourage people just to, to jump into that, um, that class um, that tends to, this summer we looked a lot at the Bible, so we we're entrenched in the Christian tradition, particularly around how to live a contemplative life, and that does not mean an inactive life. Um, so I might you there. Um, I wrote my notes inside my book. Um, there will be a vigil on election day at St. James from seven o'clock in the morning until eight o'clock at night. Um, Nonpartisan, um, we will invite the entire community to it. Um, couple of rules for that. No um, political paraphernalia will be allowed on one's body. Um, so if you tend to wear that sort of thing and you want to come to the vigil, You'll need to remove it in your car um, before you come in. We'll hold silence and very much social distance, like 20 feet apart in there, and you'll be asked to wear a mask. And um, there'll be docents that will wipe up, glove docents that will wipe up each station between people that sit and pray there. Um, also, no cell phones. 
Um, we want it to be quiet and for a time that people can pray, we'll invite people to just leave technology for a few minutes in their car. Um, I think we have enough docents, but if you did sign up for that, um, I believe tomorrow in the epistle, you'll find the exact sign up sheet for a two hour shift. Um, and there will be snacks and um, um, all you'll need for social distancing and it's the hand sanitizer and all that to keep yourself safe um, in a docent room that'll be in the library that day. Um, and you are certainly welcome when you get the um, flyer for that in the epistle to forward that on to people in the community. Um, I uh, encourage you to um, take 20 or 30 minutes from midweek and join us in a beautiful contemplative practice of prayer practice and moment of collective prayer um, on Wednesday nights. We begin with music at 7.30 and um, pray together at 8. And that service um, culminates in the sacrament of anointing and we anoint ourselves. It's quite beautiful. I invite you to be part of that. Um, we're also moving through um, some of the Gospel of Thomas at that service. So if that's a text that's been important to you or you're interested in that, you'll, you'll find that there. Um, Thursday morning, a new New Testament Bible study continues this week. Um, again, one of those things like the strip, you can jump in at any point in that conversation. We're working through um, the Gospel of Mary, which is a text found to us in the last 150 years. Um, the only gospel that we know of that is attributed to a woman um, and speaks to some early dynamics in um, the Christian um, history um, that are very revelatory for where we are today and how we might live and move into Christianity in our own time. Um, the last Thursday night of the month, I don't have my calendar in front of me, I'll pop it up, is um, Conversations That Matter. Um, you don't need to read anything for that. We're going to look at some work from Ibram X. Kendi, who's written several history books and also practical books that have been part of the New York Times bestseller lately. So I invite you into that conversation. And finally, I wonder if there are any birthdays today. I don't know if I think Ron Rios is attending church today in Rome because one can do that in, um, in this day of Zoom church. But raise your hand and help me look everybody if you see anybody with a birthday today any, or this week, not today, this week. Oh, Susan Carter, I see you. Anyone else? Okay, let's sing. I'm gonna sing for you, oh no. Um, and we're gonna celebrate um, the birthdays of those we love. The two I'm aware of in the moment is Ron Rio, so somebody can let him know we sang to him, and Susan Carter. Here we go. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, our beloved. Happy birthday to you. Was that really off tune? Is that why y'all jumped in? <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. I think we have a benediction and then.